Good morning, everyone. Glad everybody's uh, been able to come in and join us this morning. Like Jeff said, um, you know, we're, you know, glad to be able to do this and uh, spend a few minutes talking about, you know, kind of what we're expecting for this coming winter. And what I want to start off with is looking at, you know, what is normal, you know, trying to figure out, you know, just to kind of give us a, an idea of what, what do we normally get around here as far as winter goes, so we can really try to, um, you know, get a feel for, for what we should expect. So um, you can see in Richmond, the, um, you know, the, the average snowfall um, is right now is 8.8 .8 inches. Um, and down in Norfolk, the average is 6.2. And when we look at the median value, the median value is the actual one that's, if we took all 30 years, and when we do climatology, we're looking at 30 years of, of data here, okay? So we take all 30 totals and we put it, and we took value number 15, that's what the median value is. And you see the median value for most locations is generally about an inch lower or so than average. Some cases, even a little bit more when you get further to the um, north and west of Richmond. So, yeah, those median values definitely drop off. So a lot of times it's better when we're looking at these climatology things to actually look at the median value. That kind of really gives you more of what actually happens half the time. And part of that is because um, with snowfall, we tend to get some years where we get bigger totals. So if you have one really big storm, a lot of times it can then start to skew with your averages when you start adding everything all together and then dividing. So um, a lot of times looking at the median value really helps. And the other thing I want you to see on here is notice that when the image on the left, we've actually looking at the um, previous climatology that we've been using for you know the last 10 years or so, um, from 1981 to 2010. And then the image on the right is the new climatology. Now that we're through 2020 into 2021, we've been able to generate a new 30 year normal. So the 91 to 2000 is what we're working off of now as far as the normals. And the thing to notice here too, is notice that the values pretty much across the board are lower now, whether it be the average or the median values are all lower. And part of that is because the period of the uh, the 1980s, which had been in the previous data set, was actually one of the snowier periods in the last 30 to 40 years by comparison to the 90s, the 2000s, and in the 2010s. So by taking those higher values out from the 1980s, we're seeing that shift, that drop um, in the snowfall uh, averages and the median values. So you know, and then, like I said, it's pretty consistent. We're seeing that drop generally about an inch to an inch and a half across the board. Um, so the only place we really haven't seen much of a dip um, actually is on the eastern shore of the Delmarva. So um, those areas have actually stayed up and actually have, you know, even in Norfolk has a, you know, just slightly higher um, average snowfall. So, you know, that's one of the things that we're seeing in the change in the climatology is, is the, um, you know, is those reductions a bit in the average. So, but overall speaking, you know, we're still kind of in the same range where we're dealing with, you know, um, from the Piedmont areas into the I-95 quarter, we're generally looking somewhere between, you know, eight inches up to maybe a little bit more than a foot up to maybe about 16 in that area. And then as we get over toward the coast, generally the values are less than eight inches, um, except as you get up into around Salisbury and those areas, you're seeing a little bit more snowfall there. So they kind of fall in a little bit more with areas more to the west. So. Yeah, you know, that's kind of you know falls in line with what we you would expect when the considering the fact that we've got the the bay and the ocean right there, and a lot of times that warmer air, especially in the in the tide water and um, portions of you know northeast North Carolina, that warmer air gets in and tends to want to turn the precip over um, from snow to rain. So you know, but it gives you a really good idea of what we're looking at climatology wise. Jeff, let's go ahead to the next slide. And the, what I want to look at here is we're going to look at the next two slides. We're going to look at um, kind of recent rate. Uh, winter seasons in Richmond and in Norfolk. And you can see by this distribution here, we're looking at kind of um, kind of trying to kind of grade where we are. You know, what can you, what can you expect 10% of the time, you know, 50% of the time, then maybe up toward about 90% of the time. And you can see based upon these numbers here, and we're looking at the entire 40 year period. So we're looking from the 80, 81 winter up through last winter, you know, in this. So you could, would, you would kind of expect what you would see is that the 10% time, we would see four winters out of ten out of out of the forty would be you know one point three inches or less, and when we get up to the ninety percent, you know we would actually see you know uh, four four winters twenty one inches or more. So those are kind of the extremes. And when you actually look back at the data, we actually have we actually had five years on each end of that distribution. So that distribution really looks pretty good based upon what we're looking at. So you've had five seasons in the last forty years that are over twenty one inches. So you're looking at the winters of 80, 1982, 1983, 1987, 
1996, and the last one was in 2010. So you can see a little bit when we were talking about the climatology before why the 1980s had those higher values. You had three, you know, three winners that had over 21 inches. So you had three that were in that 90 percentile just in the in that one decade. So and since then we've only had two in the last 30 years. On the opposite end of that, we've also had five winners that have had you know less than 1.3. They've been 1981, 1992, 98, then 2007 and 2008 were back-to-back -back winners that were really below normal. So um, again, you know, we have, you know, most of these rings that we've seen are haven't occurred in the last decade. Jeff, go ahead and hit, let's um, kind of scroll through and we can look at the snowfall totals over the last kind of about seven or eight winters. And notice how many of these um, actually enrichment are actually up on the upper end. Um, we've had, you know, five different winters in the last eight that have actually been, you know, 12 inches or more, so 70% or more. Some of that is based upon the fact that, you know, if we have, a big storm a lot of times it can overwhelm the entire average for the season um, the 2018 2019 winter is a prime example of that we had a big snowfall um, early in the season december 9th we had a uh, big snowfall across richmond hit me you know, from farmville all the way you know up into the northern neck um you know but that one event drove the entire season so sometimes you know when you look at the season as a whole you do get a little bit of you know one storm can really drive and overwhelm the values but Again, you know, the last, you know, like I said, you know, five times in the last eight years, we've had a pretty good distribution on the upper end of the snowfall totals. And only once have we been down toward that bottom end. And that was the uh, couple winters ago where we only had an inch and a half. Now let's go ahead and shift over to Norfolk. And the thing we'll go ahead and see at Norfolk here again, Jeff, go ahead and slide through and add the totals for the last um, eight years in. Um, you've got a little bit more variability here in Norfolk. Um, notice You've had you had uh, three of them that were above 80 in the above the 80th percentile for snowfall. So we've had a couple really big seasons, um, but then at the same time we've also had some that have been extremely low. Um, so the last couple of winters um, in 18 and 19 were very low. Um, last year we got a little bit more, got a little bit closer to average at 3.4. The thing to look at on that 18 19 season, remember we were looking at Richmond a minute ago. Richmond had you know they were over 13 inches for that month for that uh, winter season you know, up on the upper end of the scale, yet down in Norfolk, you know, what are we talking, you know, 70 miles, 80 miles away, you know, much lower value. You know, we had a tenth of an inch. So again, you can see kind of how you've got a lot of variability um, and how one storm can actually drive some of these totals. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind when we're looking at some of these snowfall things is sometimes, you know, one big storm can really, you know, drive your season. It can make it look, you know, much different, you know, characterize it much different than, um, than it actually is. So let's go ahead and take a look back at last year. I'm kind of going to set the stage for uh, for Cody, who's going to go next and talk about the winter outlook. Um, one thing I want you to remind you of, you can see the image on the left. That was the forecast last year um, from the uh, Climate Prediction Center for what the winter outlook was going to be. And we were in La Nina last year. That was the ENSO phase that we were in. That was kind of the one of the big driving forces behind their forecast. And you notice, you know, from a temperature or from a precipitation perspective last year, they were actually forecasting, you know, near average or below average type precipitation. That's what the, the forecast was. Well, notice at Richmond, that forecast didn't hold very well. Um, we were above normal almost every month. And the only month we were below normal was in March. And at that point, we're talking a tenth of an inch of below normal, which is really pretty much average. So, you know, we were generally speaking above average to near average for the entire, you know, every month. And looking at the winter season as a whole, we were six inches above normal didn't really fit with the forecast that they gave us. But when we looked at the observed snowfall, you know, overall for the winter months, we were actually kind of right on where we should be. You know, we were actually, um, for the winter months, we were just, uh, you know, about three quarters of an inch below normal for the winter. So overall, you know, snowfall was pretty much average for what we'd expect. And precipitation wise, we were above normal. Go ahead and look at the, temp the uh, next graphic and we can see where the temperature was last year for Richmond. And notice the forecast, we were supposed to be above normal. They were, they were supposed to, there was a very strong signal we would be above normal for the temperatures. Well, for the winter months, we actually didn't do that. We actually were slightly below normal, we were almost a degree below normal for the winter months. Um, a lot of that driven by um, February, which was, which was colder than normal. Um, most of us remember um, the, the uh, different bouts with ice last year in February. So again, the forecast last year didn't necessarily verify very well. Um, and a lot of it was based upon what La Nina was going to be. Now, La Nina can be very volatile as far as the signal. So even though the 
you may be seeing the, the uh, sea surface temperatures in the Pacific being below normal. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. There's several other factors that go into play. Um, but La Nina tends usually to be one of those driving forces that, you know, kind of drives the forecast. Let's go ahead and look at Norfolk. And Norfolk had, a, had kind of similar type of values. Um, not quite, you know, not, we were still above normal with the precipitation. So, you know, Richmond was about six inches above normal for the winter months. Norfolk was five inches. And again, we were coming out of a very wet period. We'd been very wet in the fall. So sometimes those fall trends bleed into um, the winter season, and, and it certainly did here. Um, so we definitely had you know, quite a bit of precip. We had more of a southern storm track going through a good part of the winter. So all those things together kind of really led to us having above normal precipitation. And again, the forecast didn't necessarily verify very well. Um, let's go ahead and look at the temperatures as well. And this is kind of going to give you the kind of the same feel. You can see, generally speaking, you know, three tenths of a degree below normal. So overall, we were near average. Um, you know, so we're really not in the below normal. But certainly, you know, the forecast here was, you know, a 40 to 50 percent chance of being above normal. And that, again, did not verify very well. So, you know, there's a lot of variability that we can get when we're dealing with these uh, forecasts. And again, you know, we had La Nina last year. And again, that's going to be potentially a driving force for us this year as well. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about what is expected for the 2021-2022 uh, winter season. Um, looking at the temperature graphic, uh, what we expect between December through February, uh, this is from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, and it looks like more likely than not, we will see above average temperatures. Uh, signals are that um, we have a greater chance of seeing temperatures above average uh, through the, uh, the winter months. And that's not saying we can't see cold outbreaks during the winter. Um, and you can slip on the next slide, Jeff, to um, look at the precipitation. Um, and for our area, uh, kind of similar to last year, um, we, kinda, we had an equal chance to uh, experience a wetter than average season, an average season, or a below average season when it comes to precipitation. Um, next slide, Jeff. And so this, these forecasts are based off of the Enzo or the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And what that is, is um, the fluctuation of sea surface temperatures in the Pacific near the equator. Um, you see the graphics. Um, Colder than normal temperatures uh, is a La Nina year. Uh, warmer than average is an El Nino year. And we do have neutral years where the sea surface temperatures are around average. Um, so what are we expecting for this year? Um, uh, what, uh, what we're seeing is La Nina this winter. Um, and what that typically means uh, for the generic weather pattern is that the jet stream goes up to southern Alaska, Western Canada, dips south into the eastern United States. Um, but you can see closer to us, it kind of stays further inland, which will lead to more storm tracks uh, to our north, uh, which would put us in the warm air um, most of the time. Um, and so last winter was also a La Nina winter. And this is a these two graphics show kind of what um, we had a scene at, for a second La Nina year. So La Nina, when we had back-to-back -back La Nina years. Uh, and this is from the 19, uh, data from the 1950s. And you can see that we typically, uh, on average, see a warmer than average winter here in the mid-Atlantic um, and also below average uh, precipitation um, during a second, second La Nina winter. Uh, kind of just to summarize what we what is expected for this winter um, above average temperatures is more likely um, this winter uh, with we'll, we'll also equal chances of average below average um, or above average precipitation um, and just some of the last La Nina winters we've seen uh, I have a, I put a list down there of the last winter since 2010 um, you see the 2010, 2011, 2011, 2012, uh, 2017, 2018, and then just last winter, we all we had a La Nina winter, um, which which second La Nina winter would we experience in this year tends to be warmer temperatures and below average uh, precipitation. 
Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to just kind of going off of um, what the Cody showed with the jet stream with the La Nina and how it tends to set up in a certain pattern more often than not, you know, during a La Nina. This is kind of getting a little bit more um, even in, in detail for shorter time periods. Some of the other things we look at, they can sort of alter the position of the jet stream for, you know, a lot of the time during a, a given winter. And so, you know, beyond ENSO, we look at some of the um, the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Arctic Oscillation, the NAO slash AO, and then the MJO, the Madden Julian Oscillation, and then also the, the PNA, the Pacific North American Pattern, and just kind of what goes on in the fall, and then just some things we've, you know, pulled together over the years and, and seeing how all these things affect affect our sort of weekly trends during, the, during a given winter. Um, and so there's more of them than this, but we don't have time to cover all that at this point. But this is the kind of stuff that makes a given winter, you know, highly variable in terms of even though the average temperature might be warm, you could still get a cold spell, you know, even a record cold spell during, you know, for a two week period or something like that. So, you, okay, Jeff, you can go to the next slide. And looking at this, this is just kind of looking at Richmond. And so we have sort of divided in these graphs here on the left is uh, temperature and on the right is, is seasonal snowfall. And so you can see how th this is sort of the, the La Nina and each one of these is on the right side of each graph. And so you can see overall that each bar is like a given winter. And so this is, covers like about a 70 year period since 1949-50. And you can see how the temperatures, you know, the, the average is a little bit above average for La Nina, a little bit colder than average for El Nino and, and a little bit closer to average for Enso neutral. Um, but you can see how there's in a given season, there are big outliers and, you know, so that's why the, the certainty in the forecast is not really as high. And then same thing with the, the snow falls a little higher during El Nino um, and a little bit lower on average with La Nina. But again, you can see the difference in given years. And like the, for, for the La Nina season here on the, on the right here, you can see this one big outlier. That was 95, 96, which was technically a La Nina, but snow falls way above average. So it's definitely not a, the forecast is definitely shows a lot of uncertainty and a lot of that can be based on like Eric talked about one single storm can kind of drive the winter just like a, a cold spell you know can can you know alter the average temperature for winter or, or a warm spell you can go on to the next Jeff and similarly similarly with Norfolk you can see um, kind of the same general trend um, that I will say with Norfolk there's a little bit more of a signal of, of high snow um, that La Nina winters actually have on average about the same amount of snow. Um, this is based on, we tend to get a little bit more of these sort of complex coastal systems that affect, that can affect the coast and bring, you know, maybe one out of every three or four La Nina seasons will have above normal snowfall in Norfolk, some of these higher snows. And so the average tends to be pretty similar, although the median values shown in the, the red bars are a little lower. Um, so there, so at Norfolk and along the coast and you know southeast Virginia, northeast North Carolina, the 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 signal for snowfall is really not much La Nina versus El Nino, while the temperature signal is generally warmer, as you can see with the, the graph on the left, um, that they're the warmest on average. Okay, you can go to the next. Yeah, this is Salisbury. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Salisbury. Um, probably a little bit more like Richmond in terms of the average snowfall is less in general, uh, you know, on average than the El Ninos and the Enso neutrals, and the temperature is a little bit warmer. Um, but but again, just looking at each you know individual year, you can see there's a lot of variability. So that's why we tend to be, you know, in that equal chances for precip, and we're you know even though we're above normal favored, it's not you know the signal's not so strong that. You know, CPC is going to forecast a 90% chance of above normal for a given winter. That's why it's like in the 40, 50, 60% kind of range. Okay, you can move on. Um, this is just quickly going over that the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's kind of a, a variable position of the jet stream. You know, the jet stream is always changing. And so when it, when it gets sort of blocked into a certain pattern, there are phases of the NAO and the AO and the PNA that we look at. And if it gets into a certain, what the, what's called the negative phase, you can see that um, on, the, on the left there, 
sort of that cold and snowy, it's kind of hard to see, but that little cold and snowy area um, over the eastern U.S., this, this kind of a trough in the eastern U.S. and a big ridge up into Greenland can help drive the storm track a little bit more over our local area and give us an enhanced chance of, of big snowstorms and, um, you know, colder than normal temperatures, which, which can give us, you know, more winter than what we typically see. And this is not really that forecastable, you know, out in long-term period. So it's kind of like, this is the wild card. So you're in an end so season, but if this, this can take over the winter, given it, you know, in an El Nino or La Nina. So this is something we've looked at sort of in, in periods of like a few weeks to a month. And so there's not a lot of lead time with something like this, but if you know that the NAO and the Arctic Oscillation, some of those other things are kind of favorable uh, for, you know, for like a couple of weeks ahead of time, you can sort of start to say, okay, maybe, maybe the next month will, will, you know, change what was been going on for the previous month. So they can, you know, we, we could see more winter in the next month, that kind of thing. Let's move on. Um, this is kind of what I was just mentioning, the, the limitations is that it, it can't really use be for seasonal forecasting um, that well because it's not predictable in a long, you know, we can't predict what the NAO is going to be in February right now. So while it's a good predictor, it's, it's, it, it's, it's limited to a few weeks in advance. So we can't really go, you know, out a long period of time with this. And then there's a link there if you want to monitor it yourself. Um, you can look at that. That's off of CPC, and you can see a graph, and it'll show the prediction for it. You know what it's been for the last month, and what it's predicted to be for the next few weeks. All right, we'll start to dive into some storm tracks and basic storm tracks that we that we see in this region. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jeff. <clears throat> so nor'easters, everybody knows. You know, familiar with nor'easters. Um, they're very track dependent. You know. 50 miles one direction or the other can make a big difference in what we actually see in our area. And there's there's lots of impacts that, you know, sometimes you may think of, you know, mostly the snow and the wind, but there's also, you know, just heavy rain is also possible depending on the track. And if it's, especially if the storm slows down and then also if the storm slows down and you have a big, you know, high pressure over to the north of us, you could have severe coastal flooding, high surf beach erosion, and then with the, the more inland tracks, as we'll see, you know, even severe weather, you know, more, more typical of spring springtime can, can occur in the winter with, you know, strong thunderstorms and even, even tornadoes. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> so we've done a, we've been working on a study, just kind of an ongoing thing around here where initially it started off with Richmond, Norfolk, Salisbury, and or Elizabeth City looking for, you know, with at least one of those sites getting at least four inches of, of snow um, or more during, you know, first to call it a storm. And doing that, we've, we've, this has led to about 115 storms being observed in a little over the last 70 years. Um, there's also probably about another 40 to 50 events we haven't really classified yet, but when, it, when you talk about more localized snow that maybe none of those four sites receive that much snow but somewhere in between, like a storm went between, the, the heavy snow went between, say, Richmond and Norfolk, and Wakefield got seven or eight inches of snow, but Richmond only got, you know, a trace of snow, and Norfolk had all rain. So there's there's additional events when you start doing that. I'm looking by ENSO. Oh, sorry. Can you just go back real quick? Yeah, just real quick, looking at the graph there, looking at El Nino versus New, ENSO neutral versus La Nina. You can see a little bit, little bit less during La Nina on, you know, overall. So just kind of fitting in with the overall, generally a little below normal snow and a little bit warmer temperatures. You can see that when you look at all these storms, it's slightly less with La Nina. You can go to the next chapter. So there's two basic um, nor'easters that we can get there. One is more of the, the, the type on the left called type A or technically a Miller A system, where it's generally one surface low pressure system. It's a little bit more simple. Doesn't mean it, you know, it actually, you know, it brings heavy snow, and heavy rain and all the all the features we talked about in the previous slide but there's generally one low pressure system and there's not as much of a mixed precip like a sleet in, a, in an ice band there's not there's not much of a chance for significant icing or or sleet there might be a little bit and you can have a transition you know a narrow zone but it's usually not the, the main part of the storm it's usually more heavy snow 
or rain and there's like a rain snow line but the type b system is the more complex system where you generally have a low kind of coming across the midwest you know coming maybe into the ohio or tennessee valley and then that first low weakens as it gets close to the appalachians and then you get redevelopment and a transfer of energy to a second low that kind of just all of a sudden appears off the coast of the carolinas you know somewhere in that region and then that low takes over and meanwhile there's a high pressure to the north now this kind of system is more challenging in general more challenging to forecast and more a much bigger potential for widespread sleet ice you know and all everything in between so these are you know probably the the least are not, you know definitely not our favorite storms to forecast but they're they're pretty common so we have to deal with them we go on to the next slide so just a, looking at the simple pattern here you know this this kind of applies to all northeast nor'easters but you can kind of see just a general big trough the jet stream plunges down into the gulf of mexico and you end up getting a low pressure you know it may be a weak low pressure in the gulf of mexico initially but the low pressure system then really develops really strengthens rapidly as it moves the low moves across florida and then moves off the carolina coast and so the jet and then it follows the jet stream up along the coast you go next slide so looking at this again the simple the simple pattern this is sort of a general pattern we've identified where you know that there's a weak low pressure system in the gulf of mexico like i was saying but then when it when it goes off the southeast coast off the you know the coast of the carolinas especially it really tends to deepen rapidly and there may be a, another low pressure system across way up to the north across the upper midwest the clipper kind of system but in the in these simple systems that clipper system is really not a part of what happens around here. That's that pretty much stays north, and it, it may you know come across the northeast a day or two after we get our snow, but we're pretty much done. We pretty much rely on that coastal system. So this this is our you know again, and the, the highlighted there is the general area. Where, for, you know, depending on the track, how close it is to the coast, that can make a big difference in where the heaviest snow falls. Um, click click next, Jeff. So. So like on average, you know, you tend to have more of a chance of rain closer to the coast and snow further inland. But if the low goes a little further offshore, as we'll see in some of the next couple slides, that, that can really drive the difference between, you know, exactly where is the heavy snow favored? Is it favored more inland like Richmond and further west? Or is it favored more, you know, right at the coast like Norfolk, Elizabeth City, Wakefield towards the coast? Okay, go to the next slide. So here's a simple storm example. Um, you can see this is this is a, a January. Um, the one Jeff was actually just we were just talking about the one after just after New Year's in 2018. Uh, you can see, you know, you can see this. This is basically a loop of about during a 48-hour period, starting uh, starting on January 3rd. You can see the low moves up the coast and really rapidly intensifies and really becomes a really massive system off the coast, especially when it got north of us. It was bad enough. You know, we had a lot of wind and snow with this, but you can see it went all the way into the northeast and it moved up. So um, um, as far as snow amounts from this, this one was, you know, a little bit further offshore in its overall track. So you can see that um, there's kind of multiple bands, which is kind of unusual that we don't see. You know, you see a little band there just east of 95 of, you know, 10 to 10 inches to around a foot and then a little bit less from Wakefield up into parts of the peninsula and then and then more again from Norfolk up into the Eastern shore. And that was because kind of a second, as that system kind of really intensified, you had sort of a second band of heavy snow come through in the later part of the storm. Um, but you can see generally this one was more east of 95 in the Piedmont, you go way out to, you know, Farmville, you know, Louisa, you basically only have like, you know, less than two inches of snow. So just a slight change in the track and can make the difference in that. So that's one of our primary challenges with something like this. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So here's a little bit more of a, a complex storm example, like the, the second type where there's really sort of two low pressure systems and a transfer of energy. This one is the January 22nd, 23rd, 2016 system. And you can see initially there's a low pressure system, just not really over the Gulf of Mexico, but yeah, inland, you know, Louisiana to Mississippi, you can go, go ahead, Jeff. This will be 12 hours later. Now the low is kind of up into into Alabama and then and there's a trough north of that up into the Tennessee Valley 
and there's high pressure to the north. But there's really nothing off the coast of the Atlantic coast at this point. Let me go to the next one. Now, all of a sudden, you can see if you go back, go a little bit to the west, Jeff. Yeah, there, there's a little weak low still hanging back there across to eastern Tennessee. But that low is weakening. And now the coastal, the coastal part, this, this is becoming the main storm now. And so is this, and then go, go ahead now. So 12 hours later, the sea is rapidly intensified. And it's, and it's lingering off our coast at that point. And then I think there's one more. So yeah, and then 12 hours after that, it's still notice there's almost two pieces low. It's all coastal low, but there's still that piece lingering there. So we're getting really strong winds. You see that pressure gradient really tightened up. Um, so, so this one, you know, the challenges are uh, what, what's added to this because this is the, the second, the messier system is the potential for some mixed precipitation and ice, and and also, you know, the slowing down of the system, you know, leads to more coastal flooding. We had coastal flooding issues with this storm as well. So go to the next slide. Um, you can see this is near Ocean City Inlet, the, the, the top graph there. So we had, you know, water levels hitting, getting into moderate, near moderate flood. They got to, I think they got to major flood levels at, at Watcher Creek with this, with this system. Um, you can see the heavy snow was, was focused a little bit more. Um, the, the heaviest snow was focused north of us, but the heavy, just but pretty heavy snow into a lot of our area, a little bit less towards the coast because there was enough of a, Enough of a warm up right near the initial shoreline in Southeast Virginia where they didn't get a lot of snow from this, but they did get some heavy rain. So that's, you know, they did have some localized flooding just from heavy rain as well. Now I talked about um, the, you know, look, looking at this being the complex system and the mixed precipitation, generally for most of our area, we kind of lucked out in, in, with this system as far as being mainly snow and, and rain without a lot of ice, but just because of that, just because of it's interpreted that way, if you were in Raleigh's area, as I'll show, show the next slide, Jeff, on the south end inland, Raleigh to Raleigh, this was basically an ice storm. Um, so, you know, and, and some of that ice did get into, I believe, our interior northeast North Carolina counties, like Bertie into over by Edenton. I believe there was a, 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 a narrow zone they did get into our area where we had some, some ice accumulations. And then, you know, not, not too far off to our north, you know, Dulles Airport had 29 inches of snow from this. And um, I, I remember being at work and some of the people from the Sterling office had to be brought to work by the National Guard. It was, that's how bad it was in DC with the heavy snow and the, in the wind. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so, um, Going back to the, you know, this can happen with either the complex or the simple system, but that track of that surface low, that really makes a difference in where the heaviest snow and or, you know, ice or rain, you know, will fall. So this this is sort of a further offshore system, and we can kind of highlight the, the blue area there with the heaviest snow. So the, if the low is offshore, but not so far offshore that we just get dry air everywhere, the, the heaviest snow will tend to focus closer to the coast. And these systems, by, by being further offshore, it generally allows the colder air from the north and west and the inland part of the, the continent to come in and make it all the way to the coast. Um, the strongest winds tend to be closer to the coast. Now, you know, in general, that's always true, but especially in this type, this, it's, you know, there may not be that much wind in west of 95 at all, really, and there and maybe not even as much snow as well. Um, so the, and these are generally associated with the coldest air masses. Um, go to the next one. Now, if a storm tracks a little closer to the coast, you, you generally start to bring warmer air in from the coast and the, the, the ocean so that most of these will tend to be, um, you know, more rain towards the coast, or, or at least maybe it starts initially as snow and then turns over to rain. That, that can especially be an issue on the eastern shore. We see that a lot where the eastern shore starts off as snow and then goes to rain. Um, you know, maybe southeast Virginia. Northeast North Carolina is mostly just rain and then inland, but inland there can be really heavy snow with this. Um, coastal flooding can also be an issue with this, you know, depending on, especially if the, the storm is likely, you know, slows down. Uh, as far as um, heavy, you know, heavy rain in that Southeast part, just kind of like that, the previous one we showed with the 2016 storm where there was like three inches of rain from Norfolk to into Northeast North Carolina. And finally, the last one. And then, okay, then this this technically would not be a nor'easter if it's if it's well inland like this. But a storm like this, if you start seeing, you know, this is also quite common 
where you can have a storm track more inland um, up, you know, kind of along the Appalachians or just east of the Appalachians going across. Um, when you get a storm like this, there's generally, to, it's us being to the, to the east of that surface low, we're generally in the warmer air mass. And so it'll probably be all rain for our area or, or most of our area. Maybe the Piedmont will get some snow from a system like this. But generally, you know, heavy rain could be possible. And if it, depending on how warm it gets, you know, you can have this, this is the type where you might start to see the potential for some severe weather if some of the other parameters are, are favorable. The jet stream and some of the low level winds and it's, you know, it, it could be 70 degrees in this kind of a, a, a track and it's really not that unusual. Um, widespread coastal flooding when it's this far inland is usually more unlikely, but you could have some localized issues, places like Virginia Beach or, or the Albemarle Sound with a strong south wind. Sometimes you can get some of the water into those areas. Um, you know, in, in the sound side flooding with this kind of system. And come to the next. So here's kind of a one of those example, one of those inland tracks where the low came up. Um, you know, we were in the warm sector. You can see temperatures are in the set. I mean, it's hard to see that graphic on the, the map on the left, but I can see temperatures are in the 70s. Um, and this is February 24th, 2012. And then the severe, you know, pretty good bout of severe weather. We had some hail even with this and some wind reports and even a tornado. So, you know, basically just a mixed bag of all this kind of things we can see in the winter around here. And you can move on to the next one. And then kind of this is the last, um, the last, you know, the Alberta Clipper system, which by, by name coming, you know, Alberta means it's originating in, in Canada and Western Canada. And the, the jet stream is, is coming down to the, you know, kind of moving from Northwest more to, to Southeast. And it's relatively dry to the South of that. And it gets pretty cold, but you know this this one is you know can be a very cold system, but there's not a lot of moisture with this because the low is coming from land, so it's coming across the Great Lakes, and there might be localized uh, heavy snow in the Great Lakes. And then for us to get this, that the low has to track a little further south, and it, a typical track would keep it more north of us. But this would be sort of our the Alberta Clipper that goes further south than normal, and in in affects our region, and it's still in general will will affect our northern, you know, northern half of our area more than the southern half. It's it's not real common to get Alberta clippers into North Carolina. Um, I mean, it happens, but it's pretty rare. And so in general, this is going to favor more places like the eastern shore, northern neck, places like that. And it's it tends to be a very dry snow. So we can, you know, this 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 is you know relatively unusual for us, but it, you know, we usually get a couple of these. And um, in general, the you know you could get not a lot of moisture with it, but you can get a real fluffy snow and get more snow than than what the the amount of moisture would suggest. So you can have a high, you know, you can have like the the twenty to one snow ratios where you only have, you know, if you if you have a half inch of liquid, you could get eight inches of snow from something like this. And that's the high end, but just to indicate that you you can get you know a fluffy dry snow, you know, that that ends up at least initially piling up and and coming in and giving you a little bit more, you know fluff to the snow a little bit more accumulation than you may expect um, in general this you know it's, it, it is associated with really cold air masses especially when the low is going this far south so it can be the challenge with this is even though the excessive the amounts are not going to be excessive you can get you know the, the the road temperatures are likely to be quite cold with this when, when you get the snow so even a few inches of snow in this kind of storm can can bring you know travel travel issues just just because it's everything's going to stick to the road. So we'll shift gears and I'm going to talk just briefly about the, our snow forecast. Most of you have seen these before. Kind of going to rehash a little bit of the probabilistic snow um, and, and kind of when you're on our web page, you know, how to interpret some of this stuff, um, you know, some of the things that can lead you astray uh, and kind of interpret this information. And so everything we do nowadays, you know, we always tell you our best guess forecast. So how much snow do we think is going to fall? And then we also give you kind of a range of possibilities. You know, okay, if we're wrong, what might the high end of snow amount be? Um, if you're looking for planning, say, okay, you're telling me it's four inches, what's the chance it might be eight inches or even 12 inches? Um, and so we, we give you that information on our website to kind of help you with some of your planning and give you a little bit of insight into the forecast. So kind of want to talk about this a little bit because anytime you're looking at our snowfall forecast and you're looking at the snow probabilities, you really want to have this image in the back of your brain so that you kind of understand what it is that you're seeing. So 
when we're looking at snowfall predictions, and, and Mike will be able to tell me, Mike Dutter can probably chime in later and say how many models it actually is now. Um, if you can imagine just taking all these different weather models, and we call them ensembles, or putting them into a blender and doing a statistical analysis of, it, of them and saying that, okay, I know some weather models are only telling me it's going to be two inches of snow. There are some weather models that are telling me it's going to be 14 inches of snow. And there's a whole bunch of weather models that are telling me it's going to be anywhere from maybe, you know, four to eight inches of snow. And so we get what's called a statistical distribution or this we call it a bell curve. And so, you know, where most of your weather models and most of your predictions are clustering is in what we call the top of the bell curve. And so you're right in what we call the middle of the distribution. And usually our forecast is going to be, you know, right in the middle. You know, what, what is most of the guidance telling us? You know, you know, if we look at preponderance of the data, what's the most likely range? And so that's where the kind of we call it the sweet spot is. And so it's the top of the curve where, you know, most everything that we're looking at that's helping us predict this the storm is predicting about this much snowfall. And of course, you heard Larry talking about it's dependent upon the storm track, depending upon the temperatures, timing of the moisture, timing of the cold air. So there's a lot of factors going into kind of making this forecast. And so, you know, based on all of that information, what does it look like is the most likely scenario? Now, we do realize there's some models that are, are suggesting more snow. Um, we call that our worst case scenario. So if I say, okay, instead of looking at just a sweet spot, and taking into account, let's say, 50% of all of the different uh, potential distribution, potential scenarios. Instead of you know, just looking at this, if I want to take into account 90% of all possibilities and say, OK, if we're wrong um, and I want to take into account some of these higher amounts, I can take into account what's called a reasonable worst case. So maybe not you know, focus on that one or two models that's saying 16 inches. You say, OK, that's just, that's just crazy talk. Um, but let's focus on maybe you know, 90%. So let's, cap, let's, let's throw out the 10% that have just seemed like they're just out to lunch. And let's take into account 90% of all the different weather models and solutions. And that gives us what's called the reasonable worst case. And you'll see that on our website. Now, if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you want to say, okay, I want to throw out everything, you know, I just want, only want to look at the lowest 10%. And so that's you say, okay, well, that's my minimum amount of snowfall. The minimum amount is not going to be that useful to us most of the time because there's always going to be models out there saying maybe you know only zero to two inches where you know preponderance of the data says okay it's going to be closer to maybe four to six inches so the minimum amount we don't focus on a whole lot um, because the, you know, from a statistical perspective it may not be that significant to us where we want to stay more focused on you know what do we expect what's the, what's the most likely scenario here in the middle of the bell curve and then what may be the worst case you know if we're wrong um, you know how much more snow could we get? And that's really where we kind of think when we're thinking about planning purposes. But just keep that bell curve in mind and realize our forecast is always kind of sitting in here right in the middle of the curve where we have most of the support from the different weather models. And so because of this, we're able to produce graphics like this. This is from the Sterling office, but we produce the exact same graphics where you know we're going to tell you, okay, we're going to always give you the most likely snowfall. So, you know, looking at the middle of the distribution of the data, what we think is going to happen based on the pattern, there is human interaction here. The forecasters go in, uh, they create their own forecast. Um, they actually do adjust the probabilities a little bit. So there is a human involved in this, you know, looking at all the stuff that Larry's talked about and, and a lot more and trying to figure out what is our best guess snowfall at this moment. And then we can also produce what is the potential or worst case scenario because it's telling you, okay, we're forecasting maybe, you know, three to four inches here in Warrington, but there's a chance it could get up to seven inches. Now, you know, that's taken into account 90% of all possible solutions. So this is what we would call a reasonable worst case scenario. And then, of course, in addition to that, because we are looking at probabilities, we can also now tell you what's the chance that you're going to have at least an inch of snow the chance you're going to have two inches of snow, the chance you're going to have four, six, eight, 12, and even up to 18 inches of snow. So, you know, if you want to go in and see what's going on, you say, okay, my chance of four inches of snow here in Warrington, I mean, there's a 34% chance. So what that's telling you is, is that almost one in three of all the weather models are saying that there's at least going to be four inches of snow there. Um, so, you know, if there's some significant, you know, some, some statistical uh, significance to that. I mean, at least one third of the models are telling you that. Where you get up into Westminster here, it says 54%. So that's telling me, if you think about that bell curve, the 50% line is always going to be right in the middle of the distribution. So that's the sweet spot. So when you see the 54%, uh, that means I'm right in the middle of the distribution. So four inches is probably a pretty safe bet. It's probably very likely um, that I'm going to get uh, you know this four inches, maybe even a little bit more, because realize 
if 50% of the models, you know, you're in the middle of the bell curve, there's 50% that's higher than that still. So you could still be a little bit above um, this four inches of snow. So kind of a way to read that. And I'll show you some examples. And all of these probabilities are available when you go to the Wakefield website. Uh, just click on the winter the snowflake icon here. So just go to weather.gov slash AKQ. You can click on the winter icon. Or if you just go to weather.gov slash AKQ and then just add the word winter, it'll take you to the exact same site. But just remember, if you're on our page, look for the snowflake icon and it'll take you to our probabilistic snow interface. Um, and on there, you'll also be able to see the different snow probabilities for different cities, uh, different locations within a different ju county jurisdiction. Um, so you'll be able to go in here, select a county or select a city, and it'll give you an idea of how much snow and the snow probabilities across the region. So, for example, if I went in here and say clicked on Chesterfield, I um, might have all the different, you know, the towns and stuff in Chesterfield County, and it would give me the probabilities. You know, what is each, you know, Chester versus Midlothian? Um, you know, what are the probabilities in those different locations? Um, because you can have variability, especially in counties like, let's say, Hanover, Henrico, uh, Chesterfield, um, even getting in the new camp where you have those transition zones, those transition counties, you can have varying probabilities from one end of the county to the other. Um, and you can get that information from our website. And if you ever have any problem with any of this, either understanding it or, or finding it, just reach out to us here at the National Weather Service and we can definitely walk you through it um, even during the storm. So we'll go through a quick example uh, of how to use these probabilities. This was a really good case back in January 7th. Um, this was actually several years ago, back in 2017, I believe this was, um, where a low tracked up along the coast, very, very heavy snow. Um, even down here in, in Hampton Roads, you see the south side, got about eight to 10 inches of snow, kind of had a nice sweet spot here of anywhere from 10 to 12 inches of snow, really across parts of the eastern shore, down in the parts of the uh, Middle Peninsula, the, the, the yeah, uh, Hampton, Newport News, in the York County, and even back in here a little bit into a Sussex, Waverly area, um, but a really good heavy band of snow um, that moved up across the area. So what did the snow probabilities look like for this, and how did, it, how did this play out? And so remember, this event happened on January 7th. So to look at the forecast, we have to go back to January 4th. So this is, you know, three days out ahead of the snowfall. We're just really now getting into the snowfall forecasting game. You know, it's, it's three days out. We're trying to at least get you an idea of snowfall amounts and how things might play out. So you see our, our forecast right in the middle of that distribution, thinking about that bell curve. At this point, it was looking like the storm was going to track fairly offshore, offshore pass off of Hatteras, and maybe go, it was going to go more straight out to sea. Um, and because it did have more of an offshore track, you notice here, the snowfall is shifted right now into the southeast. So it looks like northeast North Carolina, getting into parts of Hampton Roads, we're forecasting maybe anywhere from about three to about six inches of snow. Look at the reasonable worst case, and the reasonable worst case, taking into account 90% of all the models, has some pretty decent numbers in here, um, eight to nine inches of snow and a pretty broad area of heavy snow. And notice even the uh, seven inch snow line, as far as worst case, goes up into even Petersburg and Williamsburg, where right now, we're only, we're, we're only forecasting a dusting in Petersburg and Williamsburg because it looks like the storm track is going to be so far to the southeast. And remember, this is a forecast three days into the future. So the storm at this point most likely doesn't even exist yet. Um, typically, from the time these things form, let's say in the Gulf of Mexico or over the deep south and move, move up along our coast, if you noticed it in the weather maps that Larry was showing, that's usually only about a 24 to 36 hour time frame. So when we're forecasting something three days out, we're still in fairy tale land and we're still trying to figure out, number one, you know, where is the storm going to develop? How intense is it going to be? And where is it going to track? And, you know, that can change dramatically from one day to another when we're talking about a system that doesn't even exist yet. Everything right now is totally based on what the models are telling us and trying to figure out what, what is the most likely scenario. But the probabilities are really good here, showing you that even in central Virginia, even though we only think right now it may be a dusting, because there are some models that are bringing the storm farther to the north, um, the worst case you know, it is, does show about maybe five to six inches across central Virginia. But you notice how you do have this big broad area of worst case where it could be seven to nine inches of snow. So that tells you that there are some models out there that are tracking the storm system closer to the coast, more moisture, and maybe a little bit heavier snow. Um, just look at the probabilities. You know, if you're looking at the six inch probability, you know, it's really shading areas, mainly across southeast Virginia and North Carolina. And even eight inches, you know, looks like it's going to be limited to maybe south side and into North Carolina. So this was the forecast on the fourth. Uh, by the time you move to the forecast on the fifth, when you get up and you, you're looking at what's happening, you know, afternoon of, of the fifth, forecasting the weather for the seventh, there's been a dramatic change in the forecast. 
Um, and this is not all that uncommon because now what's happened is more models are starting to track the system closer to the coast, probably even a little more intense. Um, and it looks like we're going to have a much better chance of getting a big heavy snow event across a large area. So now all of a sudden what we have done with our forecast that we're our best guess is we're forecasting a pretty broad band here of six to eight inches of snow. Um, and the six inch line almost goes up here to Petersburg where we're forecasting four to six inches, you know, even up into parts of New Kent County and getting in the upper parts of the Middle Peninsula and the, and the Northern Neck. So a big broad area here of six plus inches of snow, six to eight inches. Look at the reasonable worst case. You know, we could see, you know, worst case up to nine inches in Petersburg, kind of seeing a broad area here, potentially of about maybe 13 to 14 inches. Again, taking into account 90% of all possible weather model solutions including our forecast, you know, what could happen worst case. And so it kind of gives you an idea here. In Richmond, reasonable worst case right now is about maybe seven inches, you know, if you want to be a worst case scenario type looking ahead. Uh, the chance of getting six inches of snow, uh, you really starting to explode here quite a bit, where if you look at the 50% line, you know, it's, it's up past Wakefield, even up maybe just uh, through Williamsburg, where you're in that sweet spot. So you have, you know, when, you see this 57% here in Williamsburg, you know, that's not a 50-50 chance that it's gonna snow or not. So be careful with that. What that's telling you is it's 57% of all of the models, including our forecast, are saying that you're going to get at least six inches of snow. So that's, that's a fair certainty. I mean, I'd be definitely a planning person at that point. I mean, 57% um, of all of our different models are telling you that that's gonna happen. That, that's a pretty high, pretty high chance. You, know, you get back up here into Richmond, about 20% of the, of the models are saying that you're going to have maybe six inches of snow in Richmond. By the time you get down to Petersburg, almost one in three, about a third of the models are saying you're going to get six inches. Looking at the eight inches, you kind of see this big broad area here where, you know, that better than a 40% chance that you could see greater than eight inches of snow. Um, so a pretty broad area here where we could see that eight inches. Um, and then looking at the foot of snow, yeah, if you're going to dial that in right now, it does look like the best chance for a foot of snow is probably the oak field up into parts of the peninsula and definitely on the south side and a little bit of North Carolina. So that's the forecast on the 5th. You move it ahead to the 6th um, and things have changed a little bit more. Uh, you notice that we've kind of nudged the 6 to 8 inch line a little bit closer to Richmond. Um, the probabilities of, of 6 inches of snow now in Richmond is up to 40%. Um, it's 50% in Petersburg. So you're getting into that sweet spot of that bell curve. When you start to get into that 40 to 60 percentile, that's telling you 40 to 60 percent of the models, including our forecast, are telling you you're probably going to get six inches of snow. So that's getting, you know, that should really kind of raise up your antennas that this is probably uh, pretty much, a, I want to say, a complete slam dunk, but you need to be really prepared for it because it's most likely going to happen. Um, you notice the 8 to 12 uh, area has really expanded in, in our actual forecast here in the middle. Um, again, now we've even pushed up the four to six inches of snow past Richmond. You got the, the this three to four inches, when you go back to three to four inches, is even going up here into parts of uh, Caroline County, um, almost not quite back to Louisa. Um, so we kind of just expanded our snowfall. You look at the worst case scenario, and now it's really kind of almost gone a little crazy. It really exploded. So now the worst case scenario is basically saying 12 to 14 inches is possible from Richmond all the way down to Hampton Roads. Um, and that, that's telling you some of, the, some of the models on the high end have really started to go kind of crazy. Um, and so we're seeing a lot, we are seeing more models putting out heavy snow across a bigger area. So you look at this, you're like, oh my gosh, we could get 12 inches of snow in Richmond and we could get 12 inches of snow in Norfolk. Well, you know, odds are you're not going to have a 12 inch snow event that's going to cover, you know, half the state. That, that's a very, very rare event. So there are some areas that's more likely than others. So if I'm in Richmond looking at this event, I say, okay, they're forecasting four to six inches of snow. That's, the, that's their best guess. That's the most likely snowfall. Um, what's the chance I'm going to get six inches of snow? Well, 40% chance. So, I mean, 40% chance I'm going to get six inches. So, you know, I, when they say the range of four to six, I would err on the high side of that. I'd err on the six inches because there's a little better than 40% chance. 40% of the models are saying I'm going to get at least six inches of snow. So that's, that's getting pretty likely. What's the chance I might get eight inches of snow in Richmond? Well, it's about a 31% chance. So that's telling me about one in three of all of the models are actually telling me there's eight inches, there could be eight inches of snow. So, you know, there, there's a there's a one third distribution that is forecasting eight inches of snow in Richmond. So I say, okay, you know, six inches is probably a really good bet. Um, and one third of the weather models are telling me, hey, we could get eight inches of snow. So, okay, 
So I look at this four to six and realize I may want to err a little bit on the higher side of that. Um, now the chance that I'm going to get a foot of snow in Richmond, yeah, it's only 13%. So, so you know, only 13% of the models are saying you're going to get a foot of snow in Richmond, where you compare that down to Hampton Roads, and it's you're actually seeing about 20% of the models, 20, 22% of the models are saying that, hey, you're, you're going to get a foot of snow down here. So you definitely kind of see a cutoff here. Um, I'd say once you get down below 15%, where you're seeing a pretty good drop in the likelihood that you're going to see a foot of snow, but it could be eight inches, and I'd say six inches is a real possibility. Um, so that's kind of how to use those probabilities since Richmond's on the edge of the event. Obviously, if you're in Hampton Roads on the peninsula here at this point, it's it's a certain possibility. I mean, eight inches is pretty much a slam dunk. Um, you know, you're probably getting closer up, you know, to 10 inches of snow. We're forecasting eight to 12, so a big range here. But as far as getting at least eight inches of snow, yeah, I mean, almost 60% of the models are saying that. So it's you know, eight inches or more really at this point. So this is the afternoon um, uh, on the 6th, right before the snow starts to develop later on on the 7th. Um, and so we pretty much dialed this in you know, even closer. Um, I won't belabor this one too much, but you can kind of still see this big broad area of 8 to 12. Richmond, you know, still sitting on this 3 to 4, um, 4 to 6 is right on the south side of Richmond. The chance of getting that 6 inches of snow in Richmond is still about 43%. Um, the chance of eight inches has dropped a little bit in Richmond. Notice it's down to 24%. So, you know, about, you know, a, a fourth of the models are saying you might get eight inches, but you still have a, a fair number, um, almost half, a little less than half, saying you're going to get six inches of snow. Um, so, yeah, so maybe still air on the high side there. Notice that 12-inch probability is really narrowed down now um, on parts of the uh, south side getting into the peninsula. And notice Richmond has now dropped down to um, about a 5% chance of getting a foot of snow. So not looking really likely at all that Richmond's going to get a foot. But six inches, yeah, that, that's still a real possibility, this 43 percentile. So this is just trying to show you how to apply these probabilities when you're looking at our forecast here in the upper middle of what we think is going to happen. When you see these worst case scenarios, make sure you go in and look at these individual probabilities and then feel free to give us a call. Um, if you want to walk through these with some of your, uh, your some of your planning groups, uh, some of your different county officials, some of your school systems, we can help kind of walk through. If you have a small planning group, a conference call, we can help walk through some of these probabilities and explain this. Uh, we explained this exact, exact event to the governor's office and a few folks trying to figure out when they saw this graphic here, a lot of folks honestly freaked out and they thought they were going to have a widespread 12-inch uh, snow event across a good portion of Richmond all the way down to Hampton Roads. And we knew we knew that we were going to have a big band of 8 to 12 inches. We knew that it wasn't going to be everywhere. Um, and we were able to really kind of dial that in um, as it event got closer. And we used the probabilities to help explain that to people um, where it was most likely for us to see the really crippling snowfall. And so that was the January 7th snowfall event. Um, and how you can kind of apply the probabilities you know, to what you're seeing with our, with our forecast. And we'll be sharing these probabilities in our briefings. Well, we'll make them look a little bit better. Um, and this is something that Mike Vetter, our science officer, is doing. And we're going to be creating these. These are the same probabilities. But now what we've tried to do is kind of make it easier to interpret so that, okay, if you're in that 10 to 40 percent uh, distribution, you're, you're in that low category. So it's, it's possible. There's a small chance you might get this much snow. Um, you know, and if you're worried about impacts at this snow amount, then you probably should just be prepared uh, because, you know, you're in that 10 to 40 percentile. It's not it's not really likely, but it is possible. You could see like in this example here, an inch of snow when you get into the orange category. Yeah. Now you're in that sweet spot of the bell curve, that 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 bump that we showed you. And so now this is pretty likely on um, locations in the orange area are likely going to experience, you know, this amount of snow. Look up at the legend here. This is for one inch. Um, and at this point, you should be preparing for at least this much snow, maybe even a little bit more. If you're in the red area, um, now you're talking about uh, greater than 70% probabilities that you're going to see that much snow. So 70% of all weather models and us are saying you're going to get at least that much snow. So if you're in the red area, um, it's a near certain probability that you're going to get at least this much snow, and you're probably going to get a little bit more. Because if you've got a, you know, let's say you've got an 88 prob percent probability of getting one inch, yeah, you, you've probably got maybe, you know, even a 50% chance of getting four inches. So you definitely want to look at the higher amounts. And we're going to be creating these probabilities both for our own forecast area and also for the entire state. So those folks with VDEM and other state-based um, ESFs, we're going to be providing state-based probabilities. Um, so you'll be able to see, you know, not only locally, what are we, what are, what are the probabilities, but then also statewide. 
And then what it's going to look like, you know, during the actual event, you'll have these type of probability graphics for the different snowfall accumulation amounts. So for one inches, two inches, four inches, six inches, eight inches, uh, 12, everything we've talked about, you're going to have these, co these color-coded probabilities. And so it's the exact same probabilities that we've been talking about, but instead of that rainbow or that, that, that kind of a blue range of colors, which gets kind of hard to interpret, we try to dial it down into really three distinct groups to try to make it a little bit more impact-based, you know, and just realize that if you're in this low category, you know, you need to kind of keep an eye on it. You need to maybe be prepared. If you're in the orange, yeah, it's you, that's most likely what you're, you're in, you know, most likely going to see that amount of snow. So good example here for Louisa, uh, the probability of getting at least an inch, yeah, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. I mean, it's better than 70% chance. And if I look at the four inches or more, um, you know, I'm in that 40 to 70%. So, you know, uh, four inches is really pretty likely. An inch is definite. And then maybe I want to go look at the six inches because I probably, I may have a low probability in Louisa of getting maybe up to six inches. Um, and so kind of more of a way to help folks understand these probabilities. And this is how we'll be defining um, you know, what folks should expect based on the low, medium, and high categories. So we'll be doing that um, this winter um, in our briefings, both in emails and the briefings that we're doing online. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop and I'll turn it over to Mike Dutter, who's going to be talking about, you know, I've been talking about the forecast within about three days. So when we're three days out trying to dial in how much snowfall is going to occur. Mike's going to talk about, okay, how do we keep folks updated in the extended part of the forecast when we don't know how much is going to fall exactly, but we know something's coming. Okay. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we, Jeff was talking a lot about, uh, you know, what we're doing in the, in the first couple of days, you know, the, or the next couple of days of the forecast out to two or three days, you know, some of the probabilistic information we have and in our deterministic forecast. Um, I wanna, you know, I, we know that, you know, a lot of you have to start preparing well ahead of time, especially for the big winter storms, you know, some, for some of these big, big events. And, and so we've been, we've been experimenting with this product the last couple of years, and, and we're gonna continue to do it this year. It, it's our, um, winter storm threat index. Um, it's it, it's a it's a product that you can get off our winter winter webpage. There, as you can see, it's it's a tab towards the bottom, and really it, in its simplest form, it, it's just a it's just a several graphics, one for each day of the extended from day three through day seven, to highlight where we think it's possible there could be some winter threat winter storm threats, whether it be from um, snow or even ice. So go ahead to the next slide, Jeff. So, so what we do is, is we, tr we try to balance the possible, the confidence of the forecast. As you know, out in the extended, out in the longer range, the model guidance really starts to, to diverge sometimes with winter storms. And so we may see a couple of the models have a significant winter storm. But you know, there's there's a few you know some of the ensembles and, and some of the other thing other models don't, but yet we have an idea that you know what if this winter storm happens, you know we're going to get a big um, it could be a big impact. So so um, you know we will in this case you know we will sort of get our you know if we think there's going to be a storm that could we don't have the, a big confidence in it, but we have you know it could be a big storm you know, we may start to go into like an orange category. Meanwhile, if we have confidence that there's gonna be a storm, but again, it's not gonna be a huge, maybe it's only gonna be three or four inches, you know, some impacts, uh, but not huge, but yet we know it's gonna be a storm, you know, that could also be, that could, could also be orange. So go ahead and uh, click your, you know, click the, um, go to the next thing. So, so that, this is how our, what we do, this is our, sort of how we gauge our graph, have our graphics, you know, highlighted. We, we have a scale from none, from slight to enhanced to moderate to high, sort, sort of like the SPC categories uh, from, for, the, uh, for severe weather, um, except, you know, we have, you know, from slight, you know, to, you know, if a threats uh, materializes, may cause travel disruptions to enhanced, you know, you know, if it occurs, then, you know, there's gonna be some disruption to travel. This is where really, you know, the slight and the enhanced, this is where you can see, you know, we may have, we may have low, we, you know, there may, some of the, few of the models may have a big winter storm, 
but we just don't have the confidence in it. So that's why usually, you know, we'll start out with slight and enhance. And then if it gets really bad as you get closer, say day four you know, or day three, you know, this is where you can get into the moderate where we're increasing our confidence of a big storm. Um, and also the confidence is increasing of the threats of the impacts, you know. So at that point, once you get into moderate, you know, we're talking about significant travel delays um, and closures. And then uh, this is something that would be extremely rare. I'm not saying it wouldn't happen. You know, maybe, maybe the January 2016 storm might have, might have, um, might have, uh, you know, went high for like day three. Um, it would have been close. Um, you know, moderate, I think we could certainly see, but high would be an extremely rare. rare. And if you do see this, <laughs> you really need to pay attention because this, we're, we're expecting something very significant in the days three through seven period. Okay, next, next slide. So this is what our graphic looks like. Um, and, and again, these are, you know, again, we started to try to do these broad brush sort of into zones from, um, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, Piedmont to the I-95 corridor, uh, the, the eastern shore and the northern neck. And then we've, we have split this zone up in the tidewater, you know, the, the, uh, near the coast and then interior, you know, coastal plain as well. But um, overall, uh, this is, these are our zones. And this is how a sort of, if, if this would be a good example, you think about the, the previous presentation that Larry did, this would be an example of maybe a, a, a strong storm that was maybe riding right along the coast where, uh, you know, a lot of the, maybe the coastal areas may stay mainly rain, but we're expecting the big snow to, to develop, say along and, and west of 95. And, and you can see that in each of these groups, you sort of have the, that matrix value, you know, to where, you know, in this, in this case here for the, um, for the I-95 corridor, you know, we're expecting, uh, you know, a, a, a moderate, you know, potential impact on, you know, pretty mod you know, uh, moderate and also the confidence you know, we're pretty high on that. We're pretty high that there's going to be a moderate potential impact. So you can sort of get an idea of how we're, um, you know, what we're thinking for, for, the, uh, for the different confidence. The next slide. And this is actually an example. This is an example from back in 2018, the, the December 9th, the big December 9th winter storm. And this was actually five days out um, from uh, from our, uh, from the actual day. Remember that storm that had over a foot in the Richmond Metro? And you can see this was where, you know, we were, we were forecasting at that point, and again, this is five days out, a, a uh, sort of a enhanced threat, both with regards to potential impact and also with sort of this medium confidence. I mean, again, so that's, that's pretty good for five days out for us. I mean, it would be hard to see much higher for us in, in day five. So again, for a day, day five forecast, that's pretty good. So next slide. And, and in fact, we actually included this in a uh, social media message, a social, and also a brief, uh, you know, I think we emailed this out to our partners as well, but it was certainly on social media um, talking about, again, this was on Thursday, so set, you know, four or five days out, um, talking about the significant snowfall. Now, at this point, we were thinking that that this most significant snowfall was going to be across, you know, the, the southern Piedmont, um, you know, to the 95 corridor, reaching the southern end of the Richmond Metro. We know that that snow was um, extended a little further north and 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 uh, and east. But for again for a day five, and we are talking about the the uh, significant uncertainty and the details. So, but this is an example of where we can use this data, this these graphics quickly to actually um, provide you some information about the extended, even, you know, even, you know, for, you know, for, for later in the weekend or into early next week, you know, something that you can start planning for, at least keeping an eye on. Okay, next slide. So at the end of the day, we really just want to give you more information. You know, we just want to let you, you know, so you can plan, so you can, um, you know, not only in the first day or two, but we're even going to give you some uh, some more information, even some more information in the extended period in the extended period as well. And again, this is all uh, planning purposes to help you make those critical decisions that you need. So, go ahead, Jeff. So, 
right off the bat, you know, that this is the, this was the most important that you, that you all mentioned about onset timing, about the onset timing of, of winter weather. And you can actually find these graphics already on our webpage. If you go to the uh, winter webpage and then click on the onset end time graphics tab, you can see, uh, that, again, this is an example from Burlington because we, we don't get much, we haven't had much in the way of wintry weather yet, but you can see that you can, you can get these graphics. And, and I know these, you know, some of the colors, you know, looks a little rainbowish, a little, little, you know, maybe aren't the um, cleanest graphics in the world, but really if I, you know, I would focus on where you are, you know, so in this case, you know, granted, you know, say if you're in Newport, then you can count on the snow, at least the, the best chances of snow starting around 1 p.m. on Wednesday. Um, and, you know, and so that's how it's going to look down, uh, you know, down here as well, if we would have, uh, when we have some wintry weather, um, you know, you have the, the timings similar to this, you know, and down here, hopefully it's a little bit more uniform, but the problem with down here is that, you know, some, a lot of times we can get rain mixing in with the snow and, you know, sometimes that can happen or, you know, happen for, you know, take, uh, takes a little bit more time to change over to snow, even like in Richmond or, or places close to the rivers, to the waters. So you still may have some you know, so these graphics may end up being a little bit um, on the rainbow color side, you know, so a lot of different colors. But again, focus on these samples, you know, focus on that to get the, the timing for, for your winter, winter onset. So uh, next slide, Jeff. So this is another graphic that you're going to be able to find. And again, they're, they're not on here right now. They will be here in the next few weeks, certainly by the first of the year. Um, and since, <laughs> since we're not getting winter anytime too soon, that should be, that should be okay. Um, but uh, another, another really nice graphic that we're getting, we're, we're going to be including is the probability or the likelihood of the, the day four through seven plowable snow. And when we say plowable, that's generally defined in about two inches in a 24 hour period, or you know about our advisory criteria, give or take. And the nice thing about this is that this is for each day in the extended, so day four, five, six, and seven. And so you'll have four graphics of this in our area. And you'll be able to get an idea of where, again, this is for central Pennsylvania, but you'll get an idea of where there's the best chances um, for, for you know, two inches of snow, and and even in this case, even if you live to say in, in Altoona or Clearfield, I mean, yeah, it could, it's a low chance, but it's you know, if if you're really sensitive to that in the you know two inch two inch criteria, then you know you may want to may want to um, uh, you know really keep an eye on it. And these graphics are similar to uh, the graphics we talked about earlier in the short term. Is that once you get into this medium time range, you know, this medium range of 40 to 70 percent, you know, that, that's where, you know, that sort of that's where we're expecting, you know, two inches of snow to be is right in from this orange to red area, um, you know, based on all the ensembles. So, you know, in the forecast. So, so again, um, you know, if, if I was if I was in State College and certainly up into Williamsport, I would certainly be expecting during this time period to have two inches of snow. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's maybe not a lock, but it's a, certainly it's a, it's a better, it's a, it's a decent chance that it's going to happen. Next slide. Now, I apologize for this. Uh, you know, it looks like this exact same slide. It, it technically, it is. Um, we're so, like I said, the team is still finishing up the, the, the graphics for these, but um, there's going to be another graphic that is similar to the two inches of snow except, uh, or plowable snow, but except this is going to be the probability of four inches, or in, in our case, sort of the probability of, you know, close to four inch uh, warning criteria snowfall in the extended for each day, days four, days five, day six, day seven. And, and again, we're going to have the same categories and, and the same rules apply here. You know, if, if I was in, if I was in Williamsport, you know, and, and I'm showing a day four uh, probability of, of a high probability of four inches or li high likelihood of four inches of snow, I would be, I would be planning on it. I mean, I would definitely be planning on it. And so one thing you are probably asking is how are these different than those graphics that I showed you a little bit, uh, oh, a, um, you know, a little while ago about the winter storm threat graphics. Well, these are different in that these are showing the probability of specific 
amounts of snow. In, in this case, two inches, or this case, four inches. The other previous case it was two inches. The winter storm graphics are really showing the probability of, or the, the like, the, the not only the confidence, but also the impacts from a potential winter storm. So they are different. So you could, it's one of those things that you could have a, a relatively high probability of four inches of snow, you know, but you're probably not, you may not necessarily have a, uh, a high likelihood of a winter, of, of a high winter storm threat. You know, it may only be enhanced or, or, or you know, or uh, maybe moderate, but, but, you know, so it's, it's, they are different. Um, you know, the, the winter storm threat graphics really are focusing on the impacts and the confidence, whereas these are just, this is really is just the confidence of, of a certain amount of snow. So next slide, Jeff. Um, same, same goes along with snow, but this now, this is actually ice. And this is actually showing, again, for each time period, for each day and extended, a probability of a uh, five hundredths of an inch of ice, um, and again, this is um, you know this is really just our advisory criteria, but um, because our warning criteria doesn't really uh, reach point two until point two five, uh, but this is just showing. I I think the best way to look at this graphic is just to show in the extended where we are expecting that ice could be a problem. And that we need to keep a that you need to keep a close eye on what's you know over the next few days, um, you know ice ice is is a very very challenging forecast um, even in the first day or two, let alone four five six seven days out, and, and so we're just we're just trying to get an idea of where there could be some potential um, ice concerns, some potential ice accumulation, even even if they're minor. Um, and you know, out in the extended. So again, it's something. It's something to once you see that an area is being highlighted for ice accumulation in the extended, just keep it in the back of your mind, you know, and and keep an eye on it. Uh, you know, be prepared. You know, if if conditions as it gets closer in time, you start seeing it go from slight or low, low uh, probability to medium to high then you need to start becoming more concerned about it. And, and certainly by that point, we probably would be starting to talk about it as well in our briefings and, and forecast discussions. So, but again, it's the same idea, um, you know, looking at these, at these different, uh, you know, just keep, you know, just giving you an indication of where ice could, could become a problem or could become, it could accumulate in the extended. Okay, next slide. Now, those, those previous graphics that I showed you are all, either they are on our webpage or they will be soon on our webpage, on our winter webpage. The next couple of graphics I'm gonna show you are very experimental. Um, and we're, we are going to, we're not gonna show them on our, on our web pages. However, they will be shown in briefings if needed. Um, and one of those, and again, this goes along with your, with your, um, some of your elements of winter storms that you're most concerned about is the peak hourly snow rate. And what this is showing is essentially a, every six hours through the next you know, day and a half, it's, it's basically gonna show where we're thinking the, what we're thinking the snow rates, the, the maximum hourly snow rates could be. So, so for example, if I'm in Louisa, right now and I and I see this, then I'm expecting then we're that what we're thinking is that there could be snowfall rates of one and a half to three inches an hour or sort of that the high snowfall rates, you know, um, during the at least the morning. This is this is the morning hours on Wednesday, um, but but on, on this graphic. But um, this is the, uh, we are expecting that there could be a period of snowfall rates of, of one and a half to three inches per hour, which is certainly high. You know, if you're in Richmond, this on this Wednesday morning, it's generally, you know, around an inch possible per hour, you know, a half to one and a half inches per hour. And then um, um, Williamsburg and Emporia, you know, we're expecting low, you know, less than a half inch an hour. So again, this, these aren't snow accumulations. These are snowfall rates, sort of like hourly peak hourly snowfall rates per six hours. And again, this is very experimental. You may, 
you know, if, if we're expecting um, a, some banded snow, some real heavy snow to develop, um, you may see these graphics uh, pop into the briefings. You won't always see them, um, but certainly uh, it's something that we're looking at and, and certainly something that if you're concerned about snow rates, um, definitely give us a call or, or uh, you know, and, and, and we can talk about it some more. But, um, you know, certainly these are graphics that, you know, we may see, um, you may see from time to time during a, a, a significant winter storm. Next slide. Oops. And then last but not least, again, one of the other elements that you're concerned about is, is snow character or how wet or dry the snow is. And it, this, this really isn't a great example um, because, I mean, this is actually using data from, from uh, yesterday from for today, if, if it was actually going to snow. Um, but, it, but it does sort of highlight where, how you can show where it could be really wet and heavy, say down in Norfolk and Franklin, Elizabeth City, to maybe a little bit drier, maybe a little less, or probably more appropriately, a little less heavy up towards Louisa and Cambridge. But you know, I, I think what this can what this can show, though, you know, if you if, if we're forecasting a foot of snow and we're saying that it's going to be really in the red, you know, really really wet, really heavy, then that's sort of that backbreaking snow, right? That the snow that can you can get injured, you know, heart attack, you know, gosh. Um, you know, stuff that you really have to be careful about. Um, but meanwhile, you know, if, if we get an Alberta clipper, we're forecasting four or five inches of snow and it's really dry and fluffy, you know, look more in the bluish. Um, you know, maybe you don't have to worry so much about, you know, you know, hurting yourself, um, you know, get out the leaf blower to blow off your windshield, you know, stuff like that. So, so um, again, this is a forecast that we we won't always see it in our in our briefing or in our briefings, but on occasion you might. You know, if we're expecting a lot of snow, and um, you know we're expecting maybe some significant, uh, uh, like a very wet type of snow, you may see this type of of a of a graphic. And with that, I think that's uh, that's all I got uh, for the new graphics. So yeah, be be looking forward to these uh, at least the ones on the web over the next few weeks. So.